and it would be untrue to say that badgers don't exist in the United States. Except they're not European badgers, they're American badgers. And the difference between the two badgers is subtle and at the same time really stark. Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to the seasons of the earth, specifically springtime. Springtime is happening right now. It's a beautiful time when life begins again, when we get to observe the birds and the bees and that's not a euphemism Uncle Toby. And it's a time that both of our countries know very well because in Britain and America and the entire northern hemisphere, the season of spring lasts from March the 20th through June the 21st. But aside from this common adherence to the vernal equinox, there are also a lot of differences in how springtime plays out in both Britain and America. I mean, of course there are, otherwise why would this video exist? And so while you sit back and chomp on America's second finest British import, Cadbury Mini Eggs, let America's finest British import tell you all about these differences. <laughs> Let me start by telling you a story. When I studied at Lancaster University in England 20 years ago, there were a lot of American students. This was my first real introduction to Americans in a social setting. They talked a lot about this thing called spring break. As in, Lawrence, what are your plans for spring break, but in an American accent? Well, I don't really have any. I'll probably just go home, visit the parents, overdo it on the mini eggs as usual. You? I don't know, I might backpack around Europe. Or visit France or Italy, meet the Pope, you know. And it occurred to me that America students treated spring break with way more intensity than us Brits. Like every one of them wanted to go on holiday slash vacation and for us it's not that we don't do those things but we, we just don't feel we have to. And there might be a good reason as to why this is. You see I found out that in America colleges only give students about one to two weeks of holiday time in spring. Meaning that I don't know American students feel more compelled to cram in as much excitement as possible with so little time. Which is amazing because in Britain we get about twice that amount. And, you know, I don't mean to gloat, but it's very rare that things are bigger in Britain. But at the university level, they are. My American wife was shocked to find that at Lancaster we got four weeks. Oh, and also in Britain, we don't really call it spring break. There it's known as the Easter holidays. <laughs> And the Easter holidays was usually the time that I experienced some of my favourite weather. I'm not all about extremely hot climates and certainly not extremely cold ones, Chicago. British springtime is reasonably dry and usually mild, with spring temperatures averaging in the 40s or 50s Fahrenheit American audience. And in America there are in fact some places that experience similar mildity, mildness, mild, I don't know the word, including right here in Chicago but more accurately the Pacific Northwest, where spring temperatures get wildly different from Britain are on the south coast in places like Florida where spring averages are between 65 and 75 degrees hence why all the students go there. On the other hand the statewide average for springtime temperatures in the state of Alaska is approximately 25 degrees Fahrenheit which is roughly Chicago's average in January. <laughs> One thing that is partly dictated by the climate of our countries is the blooming flowers, as in flowers that bloom, not as in a euphemism for the word bloody. And today I want to specifically talk about wildflowers because during my first spring in the United States, I was amazed to discover that Britain and America shared some of the same wildflowers. And you might be thinking, ooh, Lawrence, this is meant to be a video about British and American springtime differences, not similarities. Well, hold your seahorses because while there are some similarities between British and American wildflowers, similarities are different and I realise that doesn't make any sense. But it will if you pay attention. Growing up in Britain, long before I became a certified YouTube sensation, there were just certain wildflowers that would poke out of the ground in spring that you would see and occasionally eat when you were six and bored. And for me, the ones that immediately spring... <laughs> to mind are as follows. Firstly, common bluebells, and you have to be very careful about how you spell that. This is a well-known wildflower in Britain, but not so in the United States. Oh, hold up there, Lawrence. Of course we have bluebells here. Yeah, but common bluebells aren't native to the United States. They were introduced by Europeans. However, there is a type of bluebell that is native to the United States, and that is the Virginia bluebell, which is not to be found outside of North America, which is why some people call it the freedom bluebell. At least that's 
what I call it. Nobody else calls it that. And then there's the common dandelion, and you see these everywhere in Britain. And when I was a child, I was told that if you sniff them, you'd wee the bed. I think there was a lie started by parents everywhere. And while the common dandelion, which emerges in springtime, is native to Britain, it did not exist in the United States until the 17th century when it was brought here by European settlers who valued it for its medicinal purposes. Sadly, somebody forgot to tell them that it's also an invasive species, which can only account for why America later gave Britain the grey squirrel. Basically, most of the major wildflowers that I grew up with in Britain seem to have been introduced to the United States by Europeans. The same is true with woodland forget-me-nots and even the English daisy, which leads to one question. How did American children make bracelets before this? I have to say, I absolutely loved springtime in Britain, especially when certain animals would come out of hibernation. And no, I'm not talking about me, although that is valid. No, I'm talking about, for example, hedgehogs. I loved hedgehogs because every spring and summer they would appear in my back garden and they had the same haircut that I did. It also helped that I was a massive fan of Sonic the Hedgehog too. And I just imagine that since Sonic the Hedgehog is a huge game and now movie franchise in the United States, that hedgehogs would be all the rage over here. And it turns out they're not native to the United States. I haven't seen a single hedgehog in about 15 years. And in springtime, usually around April, is when European badger cubs, the cutest things you've ever seen. First say hello to the world. And it would be untrue to say that badgers don't exist in the United States. Except they're not European badgers, they're American badgers. And the difference between the two badgers is subtle and at the same time really stark. Because the American badger closely resembles some sort of hell demon that wouldn't think twice about destroying you and your friends. And the biggest difference between both countries emerging animals at this time of year seems to be how worrying they are for humans. So while Britain sees the emergence of toads, frogs, chiff chaffs, cuckoos, and a number of largely harmless insects, America just wheels out black bears for fun, and mosquitoes that bite your face off, and black widow spiders that look like they were the brainchild of Dr. Robotnik. Now, disclaimer, it is very rare that you see these animals, but that's what makes them frightening. I could open my cupboard and there could be a black bear eating ice cream, for all I know. It hasn't happened yet, but I have ordered a suit of armour. Just know that if you're a fan of both the spring and animals, your experience of both countries will be wildly <laughs> different. Like, I live in Chicago and I saw what I was told was a coyote. Ain't no one seeing that in Britain. That's it for this episode. Let me know in the comments below your favourite spring thing. I'm Lawrence Brown. You can follow me on Twitter at Lost in the Pond US. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel so that my videos don't get lost in the pond. Thank you as always to my patrons who make these videos possible. If you would like to become a patron of Lost in the Pond, you can do so today at patreon.com slash lost in the pond. Until the next video, goodbye.